except to say this is our program. We've got Dr. Nicholas Algelou talking about yes, talking about the effects on serious cultural diversity. We'll be speaking first. Uh, then Ms. Noah Osman, who's flying out from the Levant to be with us today, um, talking on the transformation of the axis of resistance on the Syrian crossroad, and then the linkage between the wars in Syria and Iraq by Maram Susri. So I'll hand over to Dr. Algelou to start with you. Census data, but these are just estimates. 
In 2011, Arabic was the native language of more than 17 million people that lived in Syria, or 76% of the population, of which 15 million, or two-thirds of the population, were ethnic Arabs, including 1.5 million Levantine Christians, and a large chunk of the 1.5 million Iraqi and 581,000 Palestinian refugees that lived in the country at the time. Significantly, though, nearly a quarter of the population spoke one of 11 other languages as their mother tongue, and a third of the population belonged to one of 15 other non-Arab ethnicities. These other languages spoken in Syria, apart from Arabic, French, and English, included Turkmen, Kurdish, Gypsy, Assyrian, Circassian, Armenian, Russian, Aramaic, Greek, Chechen, Somali, and Hebrew. And the other non-Arab ethnicities present in Syria included the Turkmen, Kurds, Gypsies, Assyrians, Circassians, Armenians, Afro-Syrians, Yazidis, uh, Russians, Arameans, Greeks, Chechens, Mandeans, Somalis, and Jews. So it's very diverse, a very, very diverse society. In addition to languages and ethnicities, as many as 25 religions and sects existed in Syria before 2011. These included as many as six sects of Islam, 16 denominations of Christianity, as well as Yazidis, Jews, and Mandeans. The largest ethno-religious group in the country was formed by Sunni Arabs, which comprised more than 42% of the population. Now, the rest of the population was either non-Arab, or non-Sunni, or both. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the effects of Arabization. Since the ascendancy of the Arab nationalist Ba'ath Party in Syria, uh, from 1963 onwards, and especially during the 30-year term of late President Hafez al-Assad, it has been taboo for Syria's non-Arab citizens to stress their respective ethnic or linguistic identities. There were certain areas, for instance, where places with Assyrian, Kurdish, Armenian, or Turkish <coughs> toponyms were Arabized, especially in the northern parts of the country. Some villages were even renamed for towns in Palestine, and many others were named for historic Arab tribes that had no link to those areas. In addition to this, with demographic shifts, with the settlement of Ghamr, or <coughs> Arabs displaced by the Euphrates Dam, in areas with high concentrations of Assyrians, Armenians, and Kurds, or the nationalization, which in reality was confiscation of privately owned Assyrian and Armenian land for the settlement of Arab nomads, such as the Shawi Bedouins. Under some local administrations, non-Arabs were barred from giving their children names specific to their ethnicity or religion, and the celebration of certain national holidays, such as the Assyrian New Year or Kurdish Nowruz, were restricted. Furthermore, private schools teaching minority languages were banned. Armenians, Assyrians, Greeks, and Jews only managed to get around this because their languages were considered liturgical and essential to the practice of their respective religious rites. Kurds, Turkmen, Circassians, Chechens, Gypsies, on the other hand, were not allowed to teach their own languages in any official capacity since they are Muslims and the liturgical language of Islam is the same as the country's official language, Arabic. Finally, it wasn't enough for someone to identify as just being Syrian or Suri. One had to present their national identity in all official capacities as Arabi Suri an Arab Syrian, even if they were not ethnically Arab. Now, this policy of Arabization and lack of recognition, therefore, rather than unifying people under one Arab Syrian identity, actually stifled many of Syria's native minorities and led to intense feelings of exclusion and resentment. It's not to be taken lightly when you are marginalized as an undesirable and a stranger in your own homeland. Since President Bashar al-Assad succeeded his father in 2000, however, he has implemented a more relaxed and a more relaxed and open policy, coupled with a modernization campaign targeting the country's infrastructure and institutions. 
I witnessed this progress myself over numerous visits to Syria between 2002 and 2010. For the first time, the country's native non-Arabs had become more visible through greater representation in the media and in politics. The Arabization process enforced under Assad senior had even begun to witness a slow reversal. Assyrians and Kurds were allowed to hold massive celebrations of their New Year festivities, for instance. Ethnic political parties were allowed to open up their own offices and cultural centres, and ethnic media networks were allowed to operate in the country. Under the patronage of the president's wife, Asma, the Syrian Trust for Development worked to develop villages throughout, Syria's, throughout Syria, regardless of ethnicity or religious affiliation. The Assyrian village of Terumman in al Hasaka province, for instance, was one of those which had benefited greatly from this program. Moreover, in 2007, an, a new Aramaic language institute was opened in order to preserve the mother tongue of the Aramean Christians and Muslims from villages in the Qalamun Mountains north of Damascus. And in 2011, 300,000 Kurds were granted Syrian citizenship, and all of this would have been unthinkable <coughs> under Assad's senior. Probably the best representation of this newfound Syrian pluralism can be found in the 2013 song, Suriya Bikul Lughat, Syria in All Languages, which is sung in Arabic, Kurdish, Circassian, Armenian, Eastern, and Eastern Assyrian and Western Assyrian by a Syrian Kurdish performer named Riber Wahid. Nevertheless, the grievances of ethnic and linguistic minorities were indeed real, and one can obviously understand why certain ethnic political parties and coalitions, such as the Assyrian Democratic Organization and the Kurdish Democratic Alliance or Kurdish Democratic Front, became signatories of the opposition Damascus Declaration in 2005, and why militias such as the Kurdish People's Protection Units, or YPG, formed in 2004, and the Syriac Military Council, or MFS, formed in 2013, often exhibit such contempt for the Syrian government and military. So, from this part of my paper onward, I'm going to be talking about the situation since 2011. And I will focus on Syria's vulnerable indigenous ultra-minorities those which differ from the larger majority populations in terms of ethnicity, language, and religion simultaneously, and, whose, and uh, those whose cultures or languages are not preserved or safeguarded elsewhere in the world. These three groups are namely the Assyrians of al Hasaka Governorate, the Arameans of Qalamun, and the Armenians of Kesa in Latakia Governorate. While not disregarding the other ethnic minorities in the country, Suffice it to say that the Turkmen have a very close ally in Turkey, as we found from one of our previous speakers. The Alawites are protected by the Syrian ruling family and have a large presence in Lebanon. The Druze have a significant presence in Lebanon and Israel-Palestine. The Shiites number in the hundreds of millions outside of Syria. Circassians and Chechens have autonomous republics in the Russian Federation. The Kurds maintain a de facto state in northern Iraq and also number in the tens of millions. Gypsies do not form one cohesive group. Afro-Syrians only differ from the majority in terms of racial appearance and nothing else. The Mandeans in Syria are actually Iraqi refugees and not native to the country. The Russians have Russia. The Greeks have a Greece. The Somalis have Somalia and they're also refugees. And the Jews have an Israel. Syria's native Assyrians and Arameans, on the other hand, have literally nowhere else to go where their millennia-old language and culture are safeguarded. The Armenians of Kesab are in a similar situation, with their western dialect of Armenian under the threat of extinction and not preserved sufficiently by the Republic of Armenia, in which only Eastern Armenian is spoken and written. Now, the Assyrian presence in Syria is older than the name of Syria itself. This is because the name Syria derived from that of Assyria in a process that developed between the 8th and 2nd centuries BC. The Assyrian Empire ruled parts of the country for more than 12 centuries between 1808 and 605 BC. 
And for at least a century, its capital was at Shubat and Lil, or modern day Tel Elan, in the Al Hasakal governorate. There has never been a time in which Assyrians have not resided within the present day boundaries of Syria. Prior to the Assyrian genocide in 1915, there were just under 10,000 Assyrians living in roughly 45 villages around the modern towns of Al Ahtaniya and Al Malikiya in the governorate of Al Hasaka. All of these villages became part of Syrian territory following the, the uh, implementation of the Sykes Picot Agreement in 1929. Now, between 1920 and 1922, with French support, an Assyrian protectorate was established around the newly, uh, the newly formed town of Al-Hasaka, administered by leaders of the assyro chaldean Battalion, connected with the French Foreign Legion. This was short-lived, however, because the British administration in Iraq, across the border, did not want to see a mass migration of its own Assyrian population, for whom they had alternate plans, enlisting them into a mercenary fighting force bound to the RAF, or Royal Air Force, called the Assyrian Levies. The original population, or the original Assyrian population of the area, was joined by refugees in the post -World War I, uh, from the post-World War I states of Turkey and Iraq throughout the 1920s and the 1930s. By the 1940s, there were more than 150 villages inhabited by Assyrians, by upwards of 30,000 Assyrians in the triangular corner of the country formed by the Khabur River and the borders of Iraq and Turkey in an area known in Arabic as Al Jazeera, literally the island, but it's another name for Mesopotamia. And you can see that right here, Al Jazeera. By the start of the Syrian civil war in 2011, there were more than 150,000 Assyrians living in about 70 villages and towns in the Jazeera. The largest concentration of these was a collection of 36 contiguous villages along the Khabur River, which were established by the refugees that came from Iraq in 1933. So, that's a, an early image of one of the villages when they were being constructed. Now, with the eruption of hostilities in 2011, and the targeting of the Assyrian community in Aleppo the following year, Assyrians began to arm themselves and form, uh, form organized militias. These included the Gozato Protection Force, or the GPF, which is aligned with the Syrian National Defense Forces and the Syrian government, as well as the uh, Syriac Military Council, which I just mentioned, or the MFS, established in January 2013, and which formally joined the ranks of the Kurdish People's Protection Units, or YPG, in 2014. This alignment with the Kurds of a minority within the Assyrians has led to, se to se several severe internal problems within the community. And even though they profess to be anti-regime, which most of the uh, Assyrians of Syria are not, most of Syria's Assyrians actually support the government, they cooperate closely with the Kurdish PYD and YPG, who in turn cooperate with the Assad government themselves. By mid-January 2013, the war had come to al Hasaka with Islamist jihadists from the Al-Nusra Front having surrounded the city. Kidnappings for, random, for ransom and random killings were rife. Even travelers were not safe as buses began to be attacked or stopped by militants. A friend of mine was kidnapped by Al-Nusra fighters this way as he was returning to his village from Beirut. One Assyrian woman was killed in such an attack and during the chaos that ensued, Someone from my relative's village, also a distant relative, pictured there, was kidnapped and murdered by a Nusra fighters who additionally stole his minibus, which was his family's only uh, source of income. No April 2013 saw a mass exodus of Assyrians from Syria as 500 of them escaped to Turkey within a space of only three days. By June, the Assyrian villages on the Khabur had begun to suffer from attacks, leading to the formation of the Khabur Guards. In April 2015, the commanders of the Khabur Guards, David Jindal and Ilyas Nasser, were attacked. After having attended a meeting with YPG officers, where they refused to call the Jazeera Rojava and recognize it as part of an ever-expanding Kurdistan, 
They were met with direct threats, but did not expect what, what was to follow. One night, five YPG fighters came to take them to a routine meeting with their commanders. Having blindfolded them for secrecy and security reasons, they took them to a deserted area and shot them. Jindo, who was on the right, died, but Nasser survived to recount what had happened. The Khabur guards, left with no other choice, now cooperate closely with the MFS, and a part of the, uh, I think it's called the Syrian Democratic Forces, or whatever they call themselves. In 2014, Al-Nusra began to give way to the so-called Islamic State, or ISIS, as they began taking over one town after another in the Euphrates Valley, destroying Assyrian artifacts and terrorizing their opponents. That October, they kidnapped three Assyrian men from Tantama, pictured here, which is the main town on the Khabur River. In February 2015, after months of harassment by IS militants, which included exhortations for them to pay the jizya tax and ordering them to remove crosses from their churches, they attacked the Assyrian villages along the Khabur and raided them, forcing their 3,000 remaining inhabitants to flee and abducting 253 civilians who didn't manage to escape on time, including entire families, the elderly, children, teenagers, and young men and women. Here you can see a group of some of the abductees. Um, among the abductees were relatives of mine who were thankfully released less than a week later. Right, this person right here is my dad's third cousin, for instance. Now, a further seven Assyrians were killed as they attempted to escape or as they tried to defend themselves and their homes. And a number of churches and houses were raised to the ground or blown up. Now, the villages were liberated that May, so May 2015, but remained for the most part empty, and all but four of the hostages have been released. Three were shot on video in September, and one has been married off to an IS commander. So these were the three that were shot in 20, I think it was 2015. In December 2015, Tal Tamar was attacked with three car bombs, leading to the death of four Assyrians. And the Assyrian villages of the Khabur have not recovered. Only 350, uh, 350 families have since returned. So that's the Assyrians of the Khabur area. Until the 1980s, Qamishli, which is on Syria's border with Turkey, was a majority Assyrian town. Its Assyrians are now struggling to maintain their dignity and influence in the face of Kurdish aggression. In November 2015, local Assyrian and Armenian organizations began to openly protest PYD confiscation of properties belonging to absent Assyrians and Armenians, occupation of Assyrian-owned public buildings, including schools and entire villages, which have been used as barracks and training camps for their militias, the enforcing of special taxes, and forced recruitment of young Assyrians and Armenians into the YPG and its affiliated MFS. A month later, so a month after this complaint letter, a string of three explosions at Assyrian-owned restaurants in the city led to the death, deaths of 14 Assyrians. As a result, the GPF set up security checkpoints around the main Christian neighborhood of the city, Al-Musla. Seeing this as an affront, the YPG fighters approached them and demanded that they take down the security barriers, stating that the checkpoints were bothering the residents. When this was refused, a YPG gun opened fire, killing an Assyrian man at that checkpoint, picture to the right. Fighting and exchanges of gunfire continued. Just over a week later, twin blasts again rocked the Assyrian-owned businesses in Qamishli, killing three more people. Now, the GPF and MFS share the responsibility for defending Assyrian neighborhoods in the city. Last month, the PYD closed down the Qamishli and Malkia offices of the Assyrian Democratic Organization, the oldest Assyrian political party in the country, for not agreeing with its brutish policies. The Assyrian population of Qamishli has dwindled from 40,000 in 2011 
to less than 10,000 today. So moving on to the Arameans. The Arameans are the Kalamun Mountains, north of Damascus, and have a three contiguous villages, namely Ma'lula, Bakha, and Jabal And they speak the only surviving dialects of Western Aramaic. So no one else speaks the language that they have maintained. The inhabitants of these villages, which can be traced over two millennia, numbered about 8,500 people in 2011. They included at least 5,000 Muslims and 3,500 uh, 3, Christians, with another 15,000 or more Christians who resided in Damascus and other cities for work and other educational opportunities, many of whom would return in the summer. In September 2013, Ma'lula became the scene of a battle between Al-Qaeda-linked jihadist Al-Nusra Front and the Syrian army. Now, the Al-Nusra Front had been based in the mountains near the town since March of that year and had been harassing the Christian population and um, the Christian population since then. During the fighting, the jihadists are reported to have attacked Christian homes and killed several people. They also torched a church and looted another one, threatening several Christian villages with beheading if they did not convert to Islam or leave. One person actually did convert to Islam at gunpoint, while another was actually executed. From the town's 3,300 inhabitants, only 50 remained during the fighting, most of whom were Muslims who had reportedly welcomed the entry of jihadist and insurgent forces. The rebels once more took control of the town, on October 21, killing around 13 civilians and wounding many more in a total of seven days before its recapture by government forces. Ma'lula was again taken over by the Al-Nusra Front in early December and they took 12 Orthodox nuns hostage and freed them just over three months later. On, on 14 April 2014, the Syrian army once more took control of Ma'lula but the town has still not fully recovered and most of its original inhabitants remain displaced. Moving on from the Arameans to the Armenians. Now, someone's already spoken, I think Paul has already spoken about the Armenians of Kesab. Now, the Kesab sub-district of Latakia government has been home to an Armenian population since the 14th century, so 700 years. And in 2011, nearly 80% of its tiny population of 4,500 people were ethnic Armenians, residing in 11 villages surrounding the town. They are a geographical continuation of the Armenian communities of Musadakh in Turkey's Hatay province, which were all but exterminated in the Armenian genocide. These horrors were repeated in late March 2014, when Kesab and its surrounding villages saw a multi-pronged attack by forces opposed to the Syrian government. Among them, Islamist militia, such as the Al-Nusra Front again, Sham al-Islam and Ansar al-Islam. During this ordeal, 38 of Kesab's Armenian inhabitants were captured when the town fell to the rebels, 24 of whom were later released. Additionally, Armenian churches and cultural centers were defaced, ruined or burnt, Crosses on the churches had been removed, as well as shops, homes, and properties looted. The civilian population either fled or were evacuated, with 400 out of 670 displaced Armenian families seeking safety in Latakia. Kesab remained under the control of rebel groups for nearly three months, and only about 250 families have returned to their homes after the Syrian army recaptured and liberated the town, which again just like Khabur, just like Ma'lula, has still not fully recovered. So moving on to my conclusions, uh, as well as possibilities for self-determination. So far, Syria's vulnerable ultra-minorities are faced with a situation whereby the current government either maintains power, continuing with its reversal of Arabization, greater openness, reforms, as well as recognition of and respect for diversity, or it is replaced. The options in the latter case are quite frightening. You have an opposition which is dominated by Sunni Arabs, backed by Turkey, who are known for their genocidal policies in the past, 
and who have previously disregarded and disrespected Assyrians, Christians, Kurds. You also have the myriad of Islamist jihadist organizations and militias from the Al Nusra Front, Sham al Islam, Ansar al Islam, Ahrar Sham, and ISIS that have been targeting all non Sunni and non Muslim elements of the population with campaigns of ethnic cleansing and slogans such as Masihiyin uh, al Beirut wal Alawiyin al Tabrut. Christians to Beirut and the Alawites to the Kofan. You also have Kurdish political parties, such as the YPG, who aim to create a greater Rojava, which actually means Western Kurdistan, on stolen Arab, Turkmen, Assyrian, Armenian, and Yazidi lands, under the guise of a pluralistic Canton system under a federal Syria, whatever their definition of federal means. Can you blame Syria's minorities if their interests lead most of them to support a president that has been demonized by most of the Western world and its media outlets. Indeed, if the current Syrian government is maintained with some amount of reform, the cultural, ethnic, linguistic, religious and sectarian diversity in the country will also have a better chance of survival, and I firmly believe that. The most logical solution for a future Syria, however, is not an Arab republic but a pluralistic republic that represents all of its citizens. Rather than a balkanization of the country, a decentralization where indigenous ethnic groups not only have linguistic and cultural rights, but also local administrative ones in a federal system, a real federal system, is one that would be ideal. For vulnerable groups such as the Assyrians of the Khabur and the Qahtaniya districts of the Hasaka governorate, the Western Armenians of Kessa, and the, Ar the Arameans of Qalamun, this is essential to their continued survival as viable ethnic groups on the face of this earth. Providing incentives for the return of these people to their areas, guarantees for their safety and rights, as well as aid for reconstruction of their communities, is something that should not just be the job of the Syrian government, but also UNESCO, which is meant to preserve the world's heritage, whether tangible or intangible. As such, autonomous zones for ethnic linguistic and cultural minorities, such as the Assyrians, Armenians, Arameans, Kurds, Turkmen, Circassians, Yazidis, and Greeks, as well as religious minorities, such as the Levantine Christians, the Druze, the Alawites, Ismailis, Twelve Shiites, will not only help to preserve their demographic strength as part of a future Syria, but will also ensure the country's continued cultural diversity in the future. As a wise man once said, good fences make good neighbors. This should not be seen as a division of Syrian society. I mean, Syrian society is already divided, right? Let's be realistic. On the contrary, efforts at Arabization and forced conformity only serve to cause resentment between non-Arab ethnic groups and the state based on grievances relating to exclusion and what was perceived as persecution. Had, the, had their unique cultural, linguistic, or religious attributes been recognized and upheld, on the other hand, this surely would not have been the case, and they would have been more loyal to the state. In effect, I believe that self-determination for Syria's minorities would serve to increase stability in the country and galvanize its uh, territorial integrity. Now, in conclusion, I find it hard to stomach that human beings are more preoccupied with safeguarding the habitats of endangered species of animals and plants, or strive to save the environment or specific ecosystems, yet turn a blind eye to the human tragedy of language and cultural extinction faced by certain groups of minorities. As well as the end of the pluralism, which in itself is an ecosystem, that has been so essential to the basic character of historically diverse nations, such as Syria. Previously, the solution for minorities has been to offer them visas to Western countries. Immigration, however, is not the answer. Rather, it destroys the traditional diversity of the local society and puts the heritage of small minorities at risk, leaving them smaller, weaker, and even more vulnerable. We also find uh, people that belittle the plight of minorities, preferring to compare uh, preferring to compare the existential threats of defenseless ultra-minorities to the casualties suffered by the majority groups. All lives matter and are precious, 
I'm not saying that the life of someone from a minority is greater than that from a majority group. Losing a life, however, is not the same as the extinction of an entire culture and language that is unique and unprotected anywhere else on the planet. Does the international community really want to lose that when it can be so easily avoided and prevented? In addition, the loss of a pluralistic and diverse society that is not just tolerant but accepting of one another, as represented by Syria, is something that is irreversible for the Middle East and the entire world. It seems illogical that Western countries would love to project themselves as being multicultural, multilingual, multi-ethnic, multi-faith, we hear this all the time. Yet they deny this to those countries that pioneered such a system of living in the first place, centuries if not millennia ago. Thank you very much for your attention.